Alteric Valley. Alliance players know it well. Horde players know to add it to their exclusion tab when queuing for random battlegrounds. Why is it remembered so fondly? What was so great about it? AV was added to the game in patch 1.5 along with Warsaw and Gulch, as the first two battlegrounds added to the game. Alteric Valley was a huge battleground that was supposed to be PvPVE, or player versus player and also player versus environment. The original AV had tons and tons of NPCs in it, and in order to win, you had to fight your way through an army of players and non-player characters in order to take out the enemy general, all while having an army of your fellow players and friendly non-player characters at your side. Because there were so many NPCs, you pretty much had to do the bonus objectives to win. or as they were called back then, just normal objectives. Korok the Blood Rager. This was a troll who guarded the Snowfall Graveyard. He was essentially a mini-boss in AV that attacked both Horde and Alliance players, and was part of a quest to get some sweet weapons, and of course, to take the graveyard. When first introduced, he wasn't all that much of a threat, and patrolled in the middle of the Field of Strife until the next patch where Blizzard buffed all his stats and moved him to the graveyard, making him a true mini-boss in the middle of a PvP battleground that could require up to 10 or even 15 players to take out. The Captains, Belinda Stonehearth and Gal Vanagar. Just like Korok the Troll, essentially mini-bosses inside a battleground, except these ones are faction-specific, meaning you can help them out. Having either of them up meant constant buffs for anyone near them to the tune of 20% extra health and a slight size increase. For some reason, these two captains are some of the few things to survive all of the AV prunes. The Calvary Riders. Apparently, this was the objective added to allow low level players to help with the battleground. You see, in vanilla, you could queue for AV at level 51 and be paired with level 60 players. In order to call the cavalry, you needed to complete a series of quests that involved taming the wolves, and then going out to the other side and killing the rams. Once you and your team got enough turn-ins, you could then call in a cavalry charge, where a group of riders would patrol around your base. If you had enough rep, you could then talk to the leader of the cavalry and tell them when to charge in. Deciding when to use your cavalry charge could be a game changer, as they went straight to the enemy base and did real damage. The Upgraded Guards and Patrols Just like in RTS games where you can spend resources to upgrade your units, you can turn in armor scraps to your blacksmith to upgrade your guards and patrols. In fact, guards can be upgraded up to three times with enough scraps, which just generally makes them stronger. The Air Strikes In order to use Air Strikes, you have to first save all of your Air Strike commanders from the enemy towers. You simply talk to them and then escort them back to base. But if they died, they do not respawn. And just like the upgraded guards, you need to loot players to get special items to turn in in order to use them. Once your team has enough, you can then take a beacon to the Field of Strife and protect it for one minute. And then you'll be able to tell your bat or griffin riders which areas to attack. Just like with the cavalry, since you can tell it when to attack a location, it was best to save it for a planned attack and to not just use it all willy-nilly. The Elemental Lords. These things were like summoning raid bosses to help you push into enemy territory. In order to summon either the Ice Guy for the Horde or the Tree Guy for Alliance, you needed to loot corpses of players for bloods or crystals. Then, after turning in a metric ass ton of them to your base, probably around 500 or so, you then had to escort your shamans to the middle of the field and then have 10 players present to perform the ritual of summoning. Then, after summoning the elemental lord, you had to wait 20 minutes for it to stop standing still in the field of strife and finally take off towards the enemy base. As long as you had a group of people protecting the elemental lords, you could probably push all the way into the enemy base with one, as it was pretty unstoppable by players and NPCs if properly guarded, before getting destroyed by the enemy general, that is. The Infantry Attack 
An infantry attack is similar to the cavalry charge in that you can send in an attack of NPCs to the enemy base. In order to do this, you need to control one of the two mines on the map, or both of them to speed up the process. In order to capture a mine, you just need to kill the mini boss of the mine who is a neutral NPC. Once you control a mine, you can then start to collect a resource the mine generates that you can turn in. Once enough of the special resource is turned in, you can then get attack plans from your base and give them to an NPC in the Field of Strife to send out an infantry attack. The Tower and Bunker Commanders Inside each tower was a commander who was a much tougher to kill elite mob and who gave nearby friendly players a buff periodically. In order to capture a tower, you generally needed to kill this mob, which also caused other guard mobs in the area to stop spawning. So it was a huge tactical advantage to take one out, or defend your own. In addition to the normal benefits of taking a tower, which gave you an extra war master in your boss's room to defend your general. Most matches went pretty similar to how AV is done today. One large group of players would run around and rush objectives, while small groups of players would go out and do the objectives I listed. And then the match would devolve from there based on how things went, until your team managed to make a successful push into the enemy base and destroy the general. With so much to do and such a huge space to do it all in, reaching the win condition could take anywhere from 3 to 20 hours, or about 5 to 8 hours on average. AV was not something you could do without a huge time sink. Now, let's talk about the Alliance advantage. For those of you who probably don't know, Alliance have an advantage in this battleground over the Horde. In Vanilla WoW, Blizzard put out a list of the most deadly NPCs. NPCs who killed the most amount of players in the game. And at the top of that list was Drek'thar, the Horde general in AV. You know why Drek'thar was the number one killer of players in Vanilla WoW? Because Alliance actually got to him more often than the Horde did the enemy general, and therefore died more often. In fact, the Alliance general was only number 15 on that very same list. The two guards who defended Drek'thar both had more kills than the Alliance general as well, appearing at numbers 4th and 6th on the list of deadly NPCs. But what gave Alliance an advantage? Well, for starters, the bunkers. It was easier for an Alliance player to capture a Horde tower than it was for a Horde player to capture an Alliance bunker. Once an Alliance player got to the top of a tower, they could just go inside a little room and be out of line of sight of all the Archer NPCs. And until very recently, in an Alliance bunker, you had to kill at least two Archers and then maybe capture the flag at a weird angle if you wanted to be able to capture it without having to kill all of the archers first, since the flag is just out in the open instead of inside a small room. This little thing just gave Alliance players a straight up easier time to capture an objective that is worth the same amount of points to both sides. It was fixed somewhat though. Horde players can now capture bunkers without killing a single archer now, but that is a very recent change. Like changed in Legion recent. The Alliance Mine is located in a more out of the way location so it's easier to defend or just ignore and no one will touch it and capture in relation to the Horde Mine which is literally on the main road and on the way to the Horde base. The Alliance Home Base is easier to defend than the Hordes. You see, the Horde's base only has a wooden wall as its natural defense, while the Alliance have a wide open bridge as the only way to get to their base. A bridge with archers at the top of the bunkers, who used to have an incredibly long firing range and attacked you the whole time you were on the bridge. In fact, these archers near the bridge appear higher on the list of the most dangerous NPCs than the Alliance General as well, taking the seventh spot on the list right after one of Drek'thar's guards. If it ever came down to a turtle, Alliance have a much easier time defending a bridge than the Horde can defend their home base. Stormpike Graveyard. The Alliance Graveyard right in front of the bridge is the most fortified objective in the game. It's near the Alliance respawn points and has a ridge next to the bridge that has a free pass to attack anyone trying to capture the flag and another higher ridge in which players can snipe down horde players with Imputney, 
and not to mention an easy bottleneck to defend a little further out of the graveyard, where the horde players have to go both uphill and in between two mountains. This graveyard just has all kinds of natural geographical advantages. The Horde equivalent graveyard has zero such advantages, and is probably one of the easiest places to take in the whole game as it's just out in the open. Same goes for the graveyards inside the bases. The Alliance one is right in front of the General's building surrounded by elite guards, while the Horde graveyard is off to the side, isolated from everything. And with it being so isolated in comparison to the Alliance counterpart, a single Alliance player can easily just run through the entire Horde base and go straight to the graveyard and take it with little problems. The neutral Stonefall graveyard is just straight up closer to the Alliance starting point. And it's on the way to Galv, so Alliance get an offensive graveyard to spawn at before Horde can capture Stonehearth graveyard, which is their offensive graveyard point, and usually the next point taken after killing Belinda. But to be fair, this is not a good graveyard to have during late game. It's pretty much exclusively an early game only advantage. There are a few more things to mention, but I'll think I'll stop there since I mentioned most of the important ones. Just to give a meaningless anecdotal account of the battleground today, I ran AV seven times in a row on my Horde Rogue to get footage for this video and lost all seven matches. Then the instant I hopped on my Alliance character to get Alliance footage, I finally won a match, and then my next three. Now these all might seem like minor things, but you have to think of it in the context of 40 random people getting together and just staying in a huge zerg all the way down to the enemy base. The alliance advantages just help out a mindless group of people more than the horde one does. And since pretty much all PvP horde players know about the alliance's small advantages, it is one of the most widely blacklisted battlegrounds on the horde side along with the Isle of Conquest, which only further gives Alliance an even bigger advantage, because no seasoned Horde players are queuing up for AV, while almost all Alliance players do it. Also, a lot of these advantages weren't really noticeable in Vanilla WoW when PvP lasted a lot longer. The Alliance only gained a noticeable advantage after the changes were made to make it quicker. But funny enough, there was a short time in the Burning Crusade in which Alliance players called for a boycott of the battleground because Horde was winning all the time when they introduced the reinforcements mechanic. Which is a great segue into... So what happened to the battleground? Marks of Honor happened. Added in patch 1.8, Marks of Honor were simple. You got 3 for a win and 1 for a loss. At this time, they were simply turned in for extra honor, but... With Marks of Honor being a valuable reward from Battlegrounds, Blizzard thought it would be nice if people could actually finish Battlegrounds in a timely manner. So they also removed a lot of NPCs from the BG, and closed off the Eastern and Western segments, completely removing three types of NPCs from the map, and making the Battleground a little smaller. Also, all the NPCs left had their stats reduced by about 15-30%. to 30%. Patch 1.10 Korok the Blood Rager and his band of trolls have picked up their bags and left Alteric Valley for greener pastures. The hostile troll mini-boss at the Snowfall Graveyard was removed, giving Alliance an extra advantage as it was basically a free cap for them now. Patch 1.11, Blizzard removed NPC guards and reduced the hit points of all the NPCs in AV again. I think you can see the trend. Blizzard over time kept slowly taking away the PvE aspects of the battleground, in favor of a more PvP focused experience, by removing the amount of NPCs on the map and making the ones who remained weaker and weaker. Now we go into the Burning Crusade, and the Marks of Honor become even more of a hot topic item. When they were first introduced, they gave good rewards, extra honor and rep, and Blizzard kept making changes to make AV not last so long. But with the Burning Crusade method of using Marks of Honor, they were in much higher demand than ever before. You see, Blizzard made it so you needed to use Honor and Marks of Honor to buy certain pieces of gear, which forced players to have to do all the battlegrounds to get fully geared. The only problem was that AV still lasted a hell of a long time, and it was possible to spend hours in AV and not get a single Mark of Honor, because you just had to leave early. 
So instead of just removing AV Marks of Honor from gear, or just removing AV Marks of Honor in general, they made two big changes to the Battleground instead. The first being more nerfs to the NPCs in the Battleground. A lot of the NPCs in the home bases of both the Alliance and Horde side got turned into normal NPCs down from Elites, so they were a lot easier to deal with. Lieutenants, the six tougher than average Elites who provided buffs nearby players, were just removed from the game entirely. The four Commanders, who, like Lieutenants, were tougher than normal and provided buffs to nearby players, who also occupy towers and patrolled graveyards, making them tougher to cap, were just removed from the game. No replacements. Lieutenants and commanders were just poof, gone. In fact, the in-game AV book called Peeling the Onion still mentions the commanders and gives advice on how to deal with them, despite them no longer being in the game. War masters were no longer spawned by destroying an enemy tower. But, they could still be despawned if one of your towers got taken. So before, it was possible to have up to 8 War Masters at a time defending your general. Now you always only have 4, and that number can only ever go down. But removing all of the elite NPCs from the enemy bases was only the minor change made this patch. The real big change was the addition of the reinforcements mechanic. Reinforcements essentially added a timer to the battleground, so it couldn't ever last as long as it did back in the day. Both sides started out with 600 reinforcements, and once the other side reached zero, you won. You lost reinforcements for each player death, captain deaths, tower losses, and you lose all of them if your general is killed. These two changes, coupled together, destroyed any remains of the original AV, and are still how the battleground plays to this day. And with these two changes, the AV Zerg was born. Players would just ignore everything and rush to the enemy base as fast as possible and just pull the general with the whole 40-man raid. There was no longer any PvP, and BGs were won by whoever got to the enemy general first. Or by the Horde, if they decided to defend at the Iceblood Graveyard. Remember how I said there was a time in which Horde actually had an advantage in the battleground? Well, this was the time. With the reinforcements mechanic, Horde actually had a geographical advantage if they decided to turtle at the Iceblood Graveyard. This graveyard is the first graveyard alliance can get that is Horde controlled, but has a small hill that you have to go around in order to access, which Horde players could bottleneck and defend with only like 20 people indefinitely. Since the graveyard was so close to the choke point, they could respawn and be back to defending quickly. And since Horde could get to this bottleneck first and very quickly, it was almost impossible for a Pug Alliance group to actually break this turtle and cap any towers, while all Horde needed to do was capture two towers to win, as they'd have a reinforcements advantage. Alliance players complained so hard about this strat that a few battle groups organized a boycott for AV. So Blizzard made a few changes to the battleground with moving the Horde spawn point further back so they couldn't set up an unbreakable turtle before the Alliance had a chance to stop it. Blizzard also added buffs to the four War Masters that increased each other's damage and health by 25% for each one, which also applied to the General. With this, players actually had to cap a tower or two before pulling the enemy General if they wanted to Zerg. In Wrath of the Lich King, during one of the final patches of the expansion, Blizzard removed Marks of Honor from the game. And with the removal of Marks of Honor, well, nothing changed. AV stayed the same. Later on in WoW's history, Blizzard would buff the bonus damage and health the War Masters gave each other, and their general, since people were able to just outgear the extra damage. And very recently, Blizzard moved the archers and bunkers behind pillars, so you no longer need to kill all of them in order to capture a bunker as Horde. In Blizzard's attempt to make AV more accessible, and to be able to be finished in a timely manner, they had to strip down and gut what AV used to be. AV started out as a PvP mixed with tons of PvE and bonus objective turn-ins for a truly PvPvE experience, and over time got turned into a capture towers and then pull the boss battleground with very little variation. With Blizzard's successful attempts at shortening the battleground, 
It's literally a waste of time to do bonus side objectives that used to turn the tides of the battle. But with how long it takes to tame 25 wolves, or to turn in massive amounts of bloods to summon an elemental lord, you're wasting precious time and resources that could be spent sitting in a tower or waiting in front of the enemy general's throne room. They take too long and are unnecessary, since getting into the opponent's base is no longer an issue. But is that really a bad thing? Is making the battleground quicker such a terrible thing? Would today's WoW player base be able to even put up with a slow battleground that takes ages to complete? I'm pretty sure people would still complain endlessly about it like they do today with everything else. I can't see too many people queuing up for it willingly. I mean, look at how many people complained about Ashran, which was the closest thing Blizzard had to old AV. I know it's not the same and it's not a totally fair comparison, but would you really queue up for AV more than just once? If it still lasted upwards of 6 hours to do, would you put up with it more than a few times just out of being curious what it was like? Unless it had really good rewards? I know I probably would, and past me who used to queue up for winter grass until broad every chance he got, would. So I know the market for it is still there, and it would be cool if they just converted it back into its old form and brought it back as like a special event or something. After all, all Horde players just block AV when they queue for random battlegrounds anyway, so nothing of value would be lost if it was just removed from the random queue and made into a single queue battleground only. That might be a good way to add it back to today's modern game. And that's it for the video. If you like the video and want to overdose on more WoW nostalgia, or just see how things in the game were before you started playing it, I have a ton of videos on this channel exactly like this one that I'll link at the end of this video.